Hello and welcome to Native Microsoft 365 Recovery Pitfalls. Today's webinar is sponsored by Veeam and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is Scott Becker. I'm from Actual Tech Media and I'm excited to be your moderator for this special event. Now, before we get to today's great content, we do have a few housekeeping items that will help you get the most out of this session. First off, we want this to be an informative event for you, so we encourage any questions in the questions box in our webinar control panel. Not only will we have team members responding to questions during the live event, but we'll also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the presentation where we'll discuss in greater detail some of the top questions that you ask. A Q&A panel is also a great place to let us know about any technical issues that you might have. Browser refresh will fix most audio or video or um, slide advancement issues. But if that doesn't work, just let us know in the Q&A and we'll provide further technical assistance. Also, in the handout section of your webinar control panel, you'll find that we're offering several resources. There's a 30-day free trial of Veeam Backup for Microsoft 365. You can also find a link to the Gorilla Guide Book Club, where you can get access to Actual Tech Media's great printed resources on technology topics, as well as a link to the ATM Event Center, which has our calendar of upcoming webinars. I encourage you to access those resources now and share them with your friends and colleagues. Now, at the end of the webinar event, we will be awarding a $300 Amazon gift card to one lucky registrant. Of course, you must be in attendance during the live event to qualify for the prize. The official terms and conditions of today's prize drawing can also be found in your handout section. Just scroll to the bottom and you'll find the terms and conditions link there. Finally, one of the best benefits of this event is that opportunity to ask a question of our expert presenters. So to help encourage your questions, we have a special additional prize for you. That's another Amazon gift card, this one for $50 for the best question. So after the event is over, we'll look through all the questions that came in and pick out the very best one and contact that prize winner. And with that, let's get to today's fantastic content. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenters today. We have Corinne Bassett, who's Technologist for Product Strategy at Veeam, and we have Edward Watson, who's Senior Global Product Marketing Manager at Veeam. Welcome. Thank you for having us. And I think I speak, we're super excited to be here. Edward and I do a lot of these and we always enjoy the interaction. I do see we have a lot of people already calling out in the chat where they're from. I'm from Ohio and I'm sitting from Ohio right here, Edward. Yes, Phoenix, Arizona. So that's actually something we do on our live stream. If you're not aware, Veeam does a LinkedIn live every Monday and Friday, and we light up an entire map. And it's always so cool to see where everyone is listening in from. So let's go ahead and get it started here. And our topic of the day is going to be Microsoft 365 and recovery pitfalls. Just a little background about this presentation. Edward approached me being like, we need to do more security and we need to create this security topic. And he kind of laid out this whole outline and it developed into this entire presentation on all the facets that you might need to worry about protecting in your infrastructure and how you might uh, mitigate some of the problems and something you might run into, which could be a terrible instance, which is what you're seeing here on the screen. All of my sites are encrypted. I need to send money in order to get them back with Bitcoin or whatever the the currency is at that time. And that's a really scary scenario. I know I see it out in the field. I'm sure you see it out in the field a lot, Edward. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we like to go into the conversation with the mindset that it's not a matter of if, but when. Attackers have hundreds of chances to try to infiltrate your organization, steal data, encrypt data. Sometimes it's all about just reputation. And we saw this, especially with a lot of the turmoil going on in the world. It's not just about trying to get money from you, but it may be just to wreck your reputation. And then you have to protect against all of these different attacks and you just have to miss once. And it can be devastating to your infrastructure. Yeah, I'll just oh, yeah. I'll just add to I'll just add to Corinne that, you know, sometimes we we you know, we, we use these native capabilities and we use, you know, uh, maybe a backup, you know, or might think about backing up data, but it's not important in our mind until these attacks happen. Right. So as we're going through this conversation, I think, you know, we'll, we'll definitely have some 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 good, uh, good insight, uh, you know, if, if attacks happen and, and really being proactive. Before attacks happen. 
<laughs> Definitely. And it's so hard. There's so many different surfaces. And I was actually talking with one of my friends messaged me this week. And I just start reading the message on my watch here. And it says, yeah, so what I've been dealing with for the last two hours is a user had multi-factor authentication and just blindly accepted when someone guessed their password, they allowed them in with a two factor by just saying yes without verifying. And they had an entire portion of their infrastructure compromised. And it took them, their entire day was just dedicated to like control of what just happened, getting passwords changed. And then you're able to send emails from that account and create pivot attacks. It's a very scary and a very real scenario that happens consistently. And there's some great data out there. There's Kapersky right here. Labs released a report of attacks that happen most office, often on Microsoft 365 data. And Microsoft 365 data is the top of that list or attacks that happen on most of the software and the infrastructure. Microsoft 365 is the top of that list. It's because it's so prevalent. I know our organization adopted it before COVID. Many other organizations adopted it after COVID. Uh, so this, even within our own data and our statistics out there, have shown an explosion of adoption, which means a higher attack reason for this. It's more likely to go through, and you'll need to mitigate that. Anything to add there, Edward? No, yeah, I think the big point here is, you know, we thought that Microsoft 365 was was relatively safe, or at least that was the that was the, what a lot of organizations thought. It was untouchable. And now, especially in the last five years or so, we're starting to realize this is actually ransomware's favorite uh, favorite place to play, right? Uh, this is this is their favorite application to target. So, yeah, we'll we'll definitely uh, have some good good advice in this uh, as we go throughout. Now, this part was kind of hard. We had to try to break it up to something that'd be easy to take away, and we found. All of these things we kept coming up with fell into one of three categories. It's going to be your people, your process, or your technology that you find the biggest flaws that someone can infiltrate your infrastructure. Taking apart the people side of the equation, there's many attack ways just from a compromised password. And many people aren't aware that the shared responsibility model from Microsoft for software as a service, they have a, an agreement they will take care of the underlying infrastructure, the underlying infrastructure network security side, but they're going to keep the domain open and allow you to lock down accounts accessing that data. So if something comes in through the front door, like through a compromised account, they have no legal responsibility for the data that's been deleted, moved, encrypted, or anything negative that's happened to that data that's happened through the front door is your responsibility. We also have phishing is huge. Uh, training on phishing, I know we had our company just had a competition that security team sent out. They are like, okay, whoever reports the most uh, valid phishing in the organization and they'll send out tests, got to be a part of a drawing. It was a fun little exercise and they continue to make us cognizant. Okay, you need to be aware of this at all times, even if it looks really legitimate because our internal guys were making it look as seamless as possible, like it came from an internal resource to compromise us. And this other one that I found within the newest is versioning. So versioning, we have this uh, sense of protection because we can always go back to a previous version of a file. There were many conversations about entire organizations getting compromised and all they did was roll back a version, even though it's kind of painstaking and going back each of those individual versions, but they're getting smart. The attacker is getting in, and as a end user, you can change your own version level. They change it to a specified version. They compromise the file, and then they do the micro version changes throughout the entire file to push it out of retention. These attacks are crazy sophisticated. I've seen organizations be compromised based off of a user, and they upload large files so that they push out the recycling bin on the endpoint SharePoint side. So. It's not really a good thing just to rely on a single set of credentials accessing a data entity ever. 
The next thing we kind of saw was around the processes and it's going to be alert fatigue. We want to know everything that's coming in, but sometimes those thresholds on the alert are just not really what we need for our organization. Every org is different. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to configure or specify and have different workspaces inside of 365. So I know I have an entire folder that I send my lab to and I have to consciously go in there. Otherwise, I'll look over and all of a sudden there's a hundred different notifications and you need to tweak it so you're not just overlooking something that could be a critical compromise. We have a software Veeam 1. Now our Veeam 1 software in an organization had alerts coming through that the customer had set up, but they had pushed all the notifications and the infrastructure to just a folder inside of their email because they turned on all of the alarms, including one of our ransomware detection, and they were compromised as an organization, but they didn't know that they were compromised, even though we were trying to tell them that they were. And then, of course, the inconsistencies when we're moving between data centers or different cloud entities. I have to dabble a little in the AWS and the Google side and just going from one to the other is like completely relearning your whole IT experience and how you apply security settings and how you lock down end users, how you make compliance and regulations to whatever you need within your organization and your compliance officer. The last facet we have here is all around the technology. Technology is always going to be this data and this hardware sprawl across your organization because you're always going to use whatever makes sense at that time. This leads to misconfigurations, lack of training, so you may just not know those settings exist. Edward and I go to a ton of conventions where we talk to end users about, hey, what's your deployment method? How are you thinking about doing this? And almost the first thing that comes out of their mouth is like, I had no idea X, Y, and Z was a thing within this configuration or I even needed to consider this. They're very different data types from our on-premises traditional. Even moving from physical service to virtualization was a huge hop and now we're just making software as a service, platform as a service, do you lift and shift? It's a huge conversation. And of course, having a trusted backup. Now, a lot of technologies out there may offer something that's similar to a backup, but if you're using the same credential set, you might as well just keep the data in the same place because the same credentials are gonna compromise those data. It's also a factor of restoration speed. What are your RPOs, RTOs that you need? And does your backup software provide that? Or is it faster just to like rebuild data? If it's faster to rebuild data, it's not doing what you need it to do. You need to test restore times. There are throttling metrics in the different cloud entities. So you do need to somewhat be aware of what those are and apply what you can to that to get the data back and make expectations with your management. Anything to add here, Edward? Well, yeah, any any uh, any cog uh, that that is compromised as, as part of this, it's almost like a domino effect, right? And uh, just a, any little breach, and I think you touched on something very important here, Corinne, with with these three is is that you know we need to make sure that we're training our people, and, and in IT, I think we're in a, a prime position to help influence this because ultimately we're we're trying to protect our our organization from all angles. Right, we've got the technology that we own, but ultimately, it's the people who are going to keep keep uh, keep the company company from from getting these infiltrations. Right, I hundred percent agree. So moving on to the next slide here, we kind of took all of those categories and try to help you think of the beginning talking points as to what are your threat vectors based off of these categories. Now, the threat vectors when it comes to people is definitely going to be accounts. But with these accounts being compromised, it's going to depend on their privilege level, how much damage they may do, unless they're able to do a pivot style and compromise another account due to that account. So you want to lock down the amount of permissions each of these accounts have so that you're not doing a tremendous sprawl and having just an entire compromised infrastructure from one global administrator. I do a lot of education in like just in time access or other access controls where you only get access during the hours that you need them or having a four rules on privileged accounts. 
The next thing here is targeted data loss. So if you're looking at what's called spear phishing or whaling, you may be targeting a certain CEO, a certain group of high level executives in the company, or you may be targeting a certain company to ruin a reputation. These targeted data losses can be just as detrimental because they're not just trying to go out there and get anyone they can. And they tend to come with a higher payout that's required on the other end because they know what you're worth. They know how much they're going to want to get from you to ruin your reputation. The uh, next point we have here is the increased chance of risk. Users are just absolutely the worst security flaw in any infrastructure. We hear it time and time again, the um, nuclear plant that had completely no access to the inside infrastructure. No one is able to access anything. They didn't even have ethernet cables on the back of their machines, but someone went out in the parking lot and just put down USB flash drives all over the parking lot, just waited for someone to plug a USB into a machine in that organization. And they had messed up the sensor. So it was a time bomb to have a failure in that plant. There's always a way around and you just have to do as much training and being aware of when something is quote unquote bad and training your users what that feels like when it's a bad situation. Now, people can lead to some of the biggest pivot types of attacks, but technically all of these categories sort of follow into you can always pivot if you're able to compromise one of these endpoints. Now, with process. We're diving a little bit more into the rules that your organization has made. So planning what your compliance officer needs, what your CTO expects, what your administrator says they need based off their tickets they get from end users. And of course, regulations. You legally have to have compliance whenever you're going from any data source. Just because you moved on-prem to the cloud doesn't mean you need to let all of those rules fly out the window. And we're sort of finding that out in the last year when we did very quick migrations. There are some regulations that you need to get your compliance officer uh, involved in. And the last thing here in this category is data sprawl. So we all have all of these cloud entities, both public and private cloud. You can even do your own in-person, like in-house cloud. These all have different ways that they're accessed, and this creates a data sprawl. When your data is sprawled across these different data entities, you're not going to have the same policies applied across each of these entities unless you're intimate with the way the policies are applied in these different clouds. So you need to have training and be able to consolidate if possible. I'm not saying put all your eggs into one basket, but make sure that you are using storage and cloud computing that you know how to secure just as properly across each of the cloud entities. And the last one we have here is around technology. So technology, I think, gives us a false sense of security. We have all of these fancy things like all-in-one compliances that have all encryption on the hard drives. They have data lock or object lock or anything that's going to stop data from being removed within snapshots. And we get this, okay, we have this all-in-one appliance that's going to protect all of our data and I'm never going to need something else. Fortunately, there's always going to become a way for that data to be compromised, and it's about creating layers. And that's why we kind of have these tiers to go along with it. Don't let any of these fall into a false sense of security, especially when it comes to the technology that you're using. Uh, Microsoft 365 is a great example that Edward mentioned before. We just got this, okay, they're taking care of everything. They have security settings. They have compromised infrastructure. They have accounts that tell us when they've been compromised if they detect like log in from Ohio and then Singapore within an hour, that's probably an issue. But we still need to apply those settings and monitor them. Extended downtime is a big thing too. I know we thought when we first moved the cloud, we'd have 99.9% .9 uptime, but we've even found in the last couple of years, data centers go down, storms happen, bigger weather changes are coming across even here in the United States and all over the world that are changing our conception of what is tolerable for fault zones. 
the last one is an unintentional tax surface. So we kind of got into a BYOD conversation at the beginning of COVID because, well, frankly, hardware was not available. You couldn't get laptops always to all of your end users. So they were using home computers. I use my phone when I'm on the road. It's my phone. Uh, we have different devices. And if your kid gets on there and I didn't know he was in the other room and all of a sudden he's got Minecraft up and he puts a package on there that my organization's calling me like, so your computer's compromised for X, Y, Z and reason. Uh, what are you doing while you're working? Um, you just need to make sure and be cognizant of the unintentional tax surface. I'm not saying get rid of BYOD, but maybe have good policies or doing application layer security within your BYOD policies. Anything to add there, Edward? No, th this is this is this is really well covered here, Corinne. Um, but let's let's dive a layer deeper here. So uh, at Veeam, we have actually some of the industry's best uh, research. So we're, we're lucky to have this at our fingertips. So this is a small plug for the Data Protection Trends Report. So you can download that as well. Um, but just thinking about you know how do, how did ransomware enter the organization? We asked the question. Uh, to to our uh, prospects, you know, thinking about the most significant ransomware attack in the last 12 months, how did this ransomware enter your organization's environment? Very interesting here that the majority of the high percentages, so the 25% malicious link, 20% uh, infected patch or software package, spam email, all of these are user centric, right? This is not necessarily the the IT's fault, uh, IT guys' fault, or your guys' fault, or you know, uh, you know, any of the technology owners in the organization, they're they're not actually at fault. It's again back to that user centric breach. It goes back to what we said earlier: are are your employees adequately trained on this to to make sure um, this is preventable, right? Because ultimately, we don't we can't prevent the you know we can prevent these attacks from happening. Um, you know, and if we can, that that's that's what we want to do is, is make sure these don't happen. You know, sure, it's great to have a backup. It's great to have native capabilities that will go through um, in place. But if we can prevent this altogether, right, this is this is a much better situation. Uh, so, again, these are no no surprise. I don't see any surprises here. Credential compromise. Of course, that's a big one. Maybe that's slightly more admin leaning, but uh, definitely no surprises here in terms of of how these um how these vectors uh and ransomware enter the organization so a quick call out yeah. to our audience because i always forget about on this platform but it's one of my favorite features if anyone's looking at the slides and they see a link on the slide they can click that link on the slide and get to that data source so go, feel free to click away and save those for later not all of these are in our uh, handout section yeah that's that's a good call out Grin. So important here, how long did it take to actually notice? So ransomware, uh, we're looking in the minutes for about a third. Uh, you start to get to the hours about, you know, half of uh, respondents here. And then even days when it comes to actually it doubled from 2020 to 2020, uh, 2022, uh, which is pretty scary. Uh, even weeks, right? So. Um, Pretty even across all of them, probably less so on the account compromise. I think uh, account compromise uh, is, is, you know, pretty heavy there in the days, uh, which is actually pretty surprising to see as well. But I, I find this pretty scary, especially if you go to days, you know, averaging 10% or even 20% for account compromise. That to me is is pretty alarming because what you mentioned earlier, Corinne, about not only the damage uh, that they can cause of, of encrypting stuff, but actually tweaking retentions, um, doing some menacing things to the native capabilities where you might not even realize that, you know, your retention was uh, adjusted or your legal hold was taken off or, you know, just data just outright deleted. So uh, it's it's pretty scary that it's taking days or even in some cases weeks uh, for organizations to even notice uh, these things have happened. Thoughts on that? 
Yeah, so when I first ran across these numbers, I had a whole bunch of thoughts at once because this is only three of the several statistics that was provided in this particular report. And it's shocking because we were doing more training now. This doesn't mean our users aren't getting smarter at being able to detect when something's happening. It means it's getting more sophisticated in the attacks that are happening to your organization and they're finding ways to go undetected. So when they can find ways to go undetected, they're able to spread further and further. It's almost like when you have viruses, the longer it takes you to determine when you've been infected with an virus, the more people you're going to be able to spread that to. And instead of spending an email to the entire organization, once you have an account compromise, you may just send to a couple key stakeholders that you find out our administrators just by like doing some reconnaissance and this sophistication is absolutely terrifying like you should see these numbers start going down for especially like a compromised account but it actually went up it took longer in certain cases for them to determine how long it had been since they had been compromised it went from zero percent for the months to like extended periods of time from there so yeah these are really scary statistics Definitely. Pretty security and guy that's I, trying to sleep tonight. <laughs> yeah, no, and I, I'm hoping we this goes down, right? Uh, we don't want to see this crawling up year after year after year. So, yeah, uh, it should be down to minutes. Uh, it's hopefully. a forever or, or Or not at all, right? <laughs> Zero across the board, right? Well, it's down profitable. We can't forget that uh, attacking an organization and all of these attacks. The reason ransomware was the number one enterprise last year, even against like the big oil companies, if you were to take ransomware and cyber attacks as a business, it made tremendous amounts of money. And if it didn't, then they wouldn't be trying to make it better. <laughs> unfortunately. Right. Absolutely. So consequences right uh really looking at it, it, what this what actually happens and some of these are actually pretty conservative um 49 of breached organizations experienced expensive security gaps one in four compliance fines 20 percent of organizations with over 1k employees uh more than 50k in losses that that's actually pretty conservative I, i've seen other numbers that are, are much higher than this this is just one report but you know, if you're an SMB, that's that's a lost business. And so, you know, you, there's there's businesses that actually get lost there. Uh, people go out of business. So this is this is pretty conservative in my, in my mind. So one of my more entertaining statistics from this report isn't one that we have called out, but is on the screenshot to the right: change in senior leadership. So it's not just organizations that are being attacked that we've seen security officers come back and be sued by the company for the compromised infrastructure. I think we saw this with SolarWinds was one of the most recent cases where they're personally attacking these people because of negligence. So you need to be aware of what you need to do. And if you're signing off on these reports, you then start to become liable for all of these different types of attacks. Yeah, absolutely. So recovery outcomes, what can we do? Let's find out. So first, uh, recovering from a ransomware attack. Okay, on average, organizations were able to recover. This is again, the, the data protection trends report. Go ahead and click it. Uh, we're able to only over, just over a third of the data is typically unrecoverable. What, what do you think about that, Corinne? I mean, it, is that even reasonable? right now for or acceptable for organizations here in 2022 is a third of the data not being recoverable even even uh you know should is, is that even acceptable today so i'm gonna just say flat no but an addendum to that it's not just because say the software wasn't doing what you program the software to do sometimes we're not really aware of what's required to get that data back to our infrastructure and we didn't test the restoration process or continue to test between updates to make sure the process still works for the type of data that you're backing up so make sure that you're running those playbooks you're pretending the disaster just happened and going through and trying to restore that data so you don't become, you know, the one third statistic of people that are probably looking for new jobs. I was going to say if I owned a company and someone I trusted to have my data secure said, I'm sorry uh, for like a third of our financial reports, that might be a tough conversation. 
Yeah, absolutely. And another thing to note is if you if you only have a third of your data, if you if you have a third of your data that's unrecoverable, that's 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 a chip that uh, those ransomware attackers are going to bargain with. They know that okay, you might be able to recover some of your data, but that third of the data that's left, how much is that worth to you? Right. And so that's that's the bargaining chip that a lot of ransomware attackers have is, OK, I can guarantee this organization can recover the majority of the data. But what's that extra last final bit worth to them? So, I, you know, definitely, uh, definitely scary. And and my I imagine a lot of these are going to be uh, a lot of these cases are going to be in the next few slides here, uh, especially this one. I think that the, the situation and this is probably the worst situation is being an unprepared organization, not really maybe using like the default native capabilities, maybe recycling, not minutes. having a backup, right? Um, and your privileged account compromises. This is compromise. This is the worst of all situations, right? Because in this case, you might have just the very low bare minimum, bare bones, um, you know, retention policy, maybe E1, right? Um, and you are going to have missing data for sure. You may even have a, a major data loss event. Uh, you're most certainly going to have to pay ransom um, and negotiate with criminals, right? So that's that's number one. Uh, we'll do kind of a worst, better, best here. That's that being the worst. Um, better being okay. I'm leveraging the Microsoft native capabilities, compliance, retention to their absolute fullest extent. Right. Maybe I've got litigation hold. I've got, you know, retention customized exactly the way I want. I've got really capable IT admins or IT organization that understands and knows how to customize things, how to leverage these tools. And you know what? Maybe it'll be a long recovery. Maybe we'll have some degree of missing data. Um, there might be some lack of granularity. Maybe we notice there's a chunk missing and we have to bring everything back instead of just that granular recovery, right? But at least we're going to be in a better spot, right? Um, and, and I think these organizations, especially the E3, E5, they're in a, they're in a fairly decent spot, maybe better uh, than, than the, the previous thoughts, Corinne. Um, I have seen a couple different scenarios where native tools were used to try to recover data because there was no proper backup in place. And there's just no granularity to it, especially when it comes to SharePoint restoration. It's an all or nothing and it takes a couple days to get back. And I've run into customers, it took a couple days to get back. They had already started to generate new data on these sites because business has to move on. And when the restoration process was done, it reverts the entire site back to that original uh, file form. So you're not getting the data where you need it, when you need it, need it in most of those cases. If you read the Microsoft documentation on how do I recover from ransomware, the very first thing on there says, check your backups. Even Microsoft is saying we're not really a backup tool. We have e-discovery, which is your compliance metric for court cases, but we won't be able to restore that particular data back to your original environments. Yeah, that's a pretty firm. That's a pretty firm admission that um, from Microsoft that hey, look, uh, verify your backups first um, <laughs> with a third party, and uh, maybe you'll you'll have some luck, uh, you know, recovering from this attack. So uh, the last, the best is um, having a third party backup. Of course, we recommend a Veeam uh, recovery capability here. And with the Veeam uh, solution, we're able to really get fast. We're really able to get granular recoveries. We're really able to provide those bulk recoveries if needed. So yes, you can recover as much or as little as needed. That is the key. Um, whatever data sets are missing, you can get them back with uh, you know the lowest uh, lowest egress possible, the lowest uh, lowest damage uh, possible. Ideally, here with Veeam, we're always striving for zero data loss, right? Um, quick recovery times, again, both item level and bulk recovery, uh, very necessary for for those capabilities. Thoughts there, Corinne? 
I think you pretty much nailed it on the head. I, if you're not, if you don't have a backup that does the things you need to restore data, because it's not always an entire site. Sometimes it's just a file. Sometimes it's a group of files. Maybe it's a compliance reason. Even we're just talking around the entire restoration capabilities is not something that's offered through Microsoft. There are many other great things that are, and we're kind of starting to go into some of those and how having parts of those features then compare to the rest of those features. And actually, that's my section, so I'll go ahead and click forward here. So the yep. first uh, capabilities that we have here are going to be going through the different license set. Because the number one question I get is like, what if E1? What if E5 or E3? And then what do you offer on top of that? Well, we have an entire webinar series on that as well, if you'd like to come check it out on Veeam. But this is a breakdown of all the ways that we can help improve your life uh, with the backup process in place. So you're going to lose the sense of data separation if you don't have a traditional backup because you can't have a separation of privileged accounts in Microsoft 365 that don't have access to everything to then compromise everything, including uh, in place locks that are not lock lock into place, so preservation holds. Then you have recycling bins. I write a blog post that's on our website about Microsoft 365 uh, OneDrive because I have to go through and I do testing and I play around in the lab and I want to start from a clean slate. So I'm like, you know what? How hard would it be to completely wipe this account out of existence so I can then start and test new data? It takes two lines of PowerShell script with a privileged account in order to wipe all of that data out where I could not figure out a way at all to get it back. So having a data separation is definitely a must, especially when it comes to privileged account restorations. Also with restore operations, I consider myself fairly well versed, but there's only a context search restoration possibility within uh, our context search export data possibility it doesn't even restore back to the original location and recycling bins. And there is no real form of granular restore unless you're pulling a file out of your recycling bin, then you're relying just like you do the recycling bin on your desktop, which I don't know about you, I empty it once in a while and I don't even think about it before it's kind of now gone. There's not a whole lot of new features that come within the E3 and E5 when it comes to here. You do get a little bit better control from your e-discovery, not backup process, your e-discovery processes for full e-discovery and not just context search. And last year, we can create a full privileged domain separation. You can even send your data to another cloud entity. You can bring it back down on premises. You could put it onto another Azure account that no one else has logged into from your current organization, if that's what you'd like to do. Then you have a complete separation of both privileged and from the data sets from the original environment. I know we used to joke when you're in an on-premises environment and someone asked you, where is your SQL or your exchange backups? And you're like, oh, on that drive on that same server. And then there's just this pause between both of you and you come to the understanding, you know that's not okay, right? As soon as that catches fire or someone compromises that account, disgruntled employee, however you say it, and the conversation moves on to how do we separate this? Uh, restore options. There really is no comparison when it comes to restore options. We have over 45 different ways to restore. And I have a nice pretty graphic that I'll show you here in a couple of minutes uh, to show all of those off. And it's not just raw data formats or back to the original locations. There's a lot of diversity in how you want to restore your data and they're in the native formats that you're going to restore to. And We'll kick it off with uh, Edward here going over some of these uh, checklists. Now, this isn't even our checklist. This is the IDC checklist, right, for what you should be looking for in a backup software for 365. That's right. We, we should mention that. This is, this is actually IDC's opinion. And the previous slide, I, I just want to remind, is actually also uh, not our opinion, um, but agreed upon. It's, it's actually what Microsoft felt were the four criteria that we uh, were able to, to achieve outside of, of, you know, fully address as opposed to what they were able to provide. So really great that we have these, these uh, testaments to, to the solution here. Um, but when you're looking at a third party backup, there's really six things. And these are, do you have the feature sets you need? 
Um, do you have the application support? Are you going to be able to restore and find things, recover the way your business needs? Flexibility and choice. Can I deploy where I want? Can I store it on-prem in the cloud? Can I utilize any storage I need? Do I have data sovereignty, right? Am I able to make sure that my data is in the region I need or country I need or border I need? Um, do I have simple things like backup scheduling? Can I meet my RPOs and RTOs? Um, is this a product line that's innovating? Are they constantly developing things? Uh, is it simple? Is it easy to use? Is it scalable? That's a big one. I think many organizations today uh, is scalability is huge. Isn't that right, Corinne? I mean, um, you're talking about multiple, you know, organizations or uh, branch offices and, you know, certainly Veeam deals with, with many extremely large companies, um, you know, 100,000 plus users uh, where, you know, now you're in a situation where you, that bulk recovery becomes critical, right? Uh, you need to be able to recover multiple users at once very easily. Uh, integrations, um, you know, do they have ecosystems? Do they have storages, right? Um, breadth of service. Are we not talking M365 here? We're talking, you know, virtual, physical cloud. Do we, you know, do we have coverage all under one platform? So I'm not piecemealing, you know, vendors together to try to protect all my data, right? That's, that's a big challenge for many, many companies today. Uh, so obviously I'm describing Veeam in every every one of these bullets but to the point you know just making sure you keep all of these six things in mind um, especially as you're evaluating backup vendors or even if you're looking to switch backup vendors uh, definitely definitely keep these things in mind uh, i do want to introduce veeam backup for microsoft 365 in the in the last uh last 10 to 15 minutes here but uh, ultimately what the goal of this solution was from the very beginning is is all about eliminating the risk of losing access to Microsoft 365 data. We've looked through a lot of really good research, I think, today, and it's pretty clear that being able to have a backup um, stored in any location that you choose that you, is easily recoverable is absolutely critical to, to mitigate against things like uh, ransomware. Also, legal and compliance. That keeps on coming up on, on surveys that organizations are just simply looking for more and more uh, legal and compliance, um, you know, capabilities where, look, I need to find that individual file or document and, and hand this off to my compliance officer. Um, otherwise, you know, we're simply not going to meet that compliance deadline, you know, um, and with the native capabilities being kind of a little more rigid, you know, having a third party backup solution that easily lets you search and find is, is definitely critical for those compliance purposes. Uh, next, Corinne, I think uh, you're going to take us through the architecture a little bit uh, on the next few slides. I am. So I was over here on the side trying to go through some of those questions. We've got a tremendous amount of questions in here. So far, they've been very good. Just a Great. friendly reminder, there is a prize for whoever asks the best question. And um, we encourage, because we will try to answer some of these live and get back to you after if we're not able to get to those. So feel free to comment in there and we'll take care of that. So... Let's start on the infrastructure. Yes, we do have a backup software. I saw a couple people asked about that. We cover many different infrastructures, physical, virtual cloud, containerized, uh, software as a service. We just released Salesforce, but more importantly today, we're talking about Microsoft 365 backup. We can run in hybrid infrastructures. You can do multiple organizations. If you absorb an organization, you'll see that within the console here. Uh, Edward alluded to, we had a lot with scalability. I don't know any business that doesn't want to scale up or many businesses that don't want to scale up and expect to have more employees, possibly merge or absorb other organizations and accounts. So we're able to do that all from a single interface. From this interface, we then have the flexibility by then and by we, I mean you guys have the flexibility to choose the kind of storage you want to use. So you can go with a major cloud provider. We're also compatible with anything S3 compatible, including on-premises, third-party cloud providers, or if you would like to use like an old disk storage or any type of on-premises block storage, you're also able to do that. 
With our latest version, we added the capability to then be able to port the S3 compatible storage types off to a long-term storage type, so like backup copy to long-term storage. We have some great statistics in that data protection report we were alluding to clicking early that have links to, hey, uh, you need to keep data for three to five years or four to five years or 10 years, depending on your organization. And we found the majority of people need to keep data for three to five years, even if they're not maybe aware of it, the compliance officers are even letting them know the cloud is catching up. You need to be aware of this. We do need to keep this data. And this kind of gives you a cheaper option for those longer term backups that you don't plan on really needing to do restore from. But if someone comes to you for an audit, you're able to hand over and show that you can satisfy their request. In the last year, we've been talking about it a lot. And it's really all about the restoration and recovery capabilities and where we're able to pick up the ball that drops from the Microsoft side. So these restorations all come in what we call our restore portals. And we have a restore portal tailored to each of the applications that we back up. So Microsoft Teams, OneDrive for Business, SharePoint, and Exchange. Something fun to know about these explorers is they weren't actually started in our 365 product. They were built within our flagship product backup and replications back when these were still on-premises applications and no one was really thinking about the cloud. We took all of the feedback from customers and we've been developing something that's really easy to use. In each of these explorers, you do not need to be an application administrator in order to understand how to restore data back to these data entities. It's pretty much a glorified Windows File Explorer. And if you can use a Windows File Explorer, I can almost guarantee you're going to be able to restore data where you need to. And whether you want to do back to the original location, new locations, if you need to export that data, they're going to be in those native data formats. And you can kind of see that in this graphic here over under the exchange category. If we do need to export data, that says like MSG files and PST files. Over under the SharePoint, you got documents, lists, and libraries. Down in Teams, you got chats and files. So these are the things that you expect to be able to restore. With our version six release, we also have something called the self-service portal, where you grant access to end users to be able to sign into a portal that you've created. This portal uses their Microsoft credentials, so they're just using everything that they use to sign in. So if you have multi-factor authentication, it's going to require that multi-factor authentication, and they can do restores from the latest backup of any data that might be missing from them. You can also delegate restore operators. So if you do have like the go-to IT guy in that department that you want to be able to grant access so he can do restore operations for those users, that's completely possible. And he doesn't get any extra privilege. He can't export that data. He can't put it into his own email box. He can only orchestrate that restore back to that original person's drive. So it's taking some of that load off the IT department without compromising or giving extra privileges to the backup server or the Microsoft 365 environment, which can be very invaluable. And Edward, so we're talking a lot of nice things about us. Let's uh, take a look at all the nice things other people say about us. <laughs> Well, yeah, and I, I think don't take our word for it, right? So we, we of course, think the solution's good. Um, but please, 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 uh, if you have any doubts or if you're interested in what other customers have to say, uh, Trust Radius and G2 Crowd, these are the, some of the, the best review sites um, available. And so we highly, highly recommend that you go in there. You can type in Veeam Backup for Microsoft 365 and you'll see some completely raw and unfiltered reviews on, on our solution. And you can even filter things down by um, company size, industry, and really get some really good insights on, hey, what, what are some of my peers, uh, peers doing with this solution and, and how do they feel about it? So we definitely, uh, definitely highly recommend to do that. And also just want to give you guys, you know, we talked about our innovation. So what did we innovate around, Corinne? What is, what is V6, uh, this self-service restore? How would you sum that up? Uh, every IT administrator's dream. <laughs> so yeah. all of those tickets that you get for those end users, we kind of assessed it on the restoration side of the conversation, but 
it's probably one of our number one requests. And that's something that I really do love about working at this product. Edward and I have direct contacts with our development and we get feedback from you guys all the time, what features you would like to see integrated. And every feature for the last three versions has been the number one request. So we had, can we do Teams backup? Okay, the next version had Teams backup. The webinars then started asking, hey, can you do S3? All right, I guess we can have S3. And self-service portal was the very next one after that. I guarantee every webinar we went on had six people that asked about the self-service portal. So there's that. And then the backup copy is great for compliance and making sure you're not using, I'm, object storage is already inherently a very low cost data source, but this is going to give you the pennies on the dollar savings to port that off to a long-term storage. And we've got some keywords in there too. We talked about data separation earlier, and I, I think that's uh, that's about as good as you can get for, for data separation, having that backup copy. So good features and good, great features coming as well. So uh, a few next steps before we get into the, the, uh, the winners of the prizes. So um, hopefully your QR codes are ready and activated. So, um, or QR scanners rather, please, uh, Feel free to read up or share this conversational Teams backup ebook. If you're interested in backing up Teams, and I, I saw that some of you are based on some of the questions, um, feel free to download this ebook. We worked really hard on this book with uh, a Microsoft MVP, Brian Posey, provides excellent insights on hey, look, you know, maybe I'm newly deployed in Teams. Maybe I've set it up in the last few years, but you know what? I've got to get a backup running. How does this data, how is this data structured? How do I do it? Right. So uh, definitely uh, check that out. Uh, next, we have our, our guide on this solution provides some insight on on how this solution works, how this how this all gets put together. And then lastly, we we would highly recommend you to see for yourself, take the 30 day free trial. So with that, I think we'll turn it back over to you, Scott. And uh, yeah, we'll open it up for any questions if we have any. All right. I outstanding. Someone yeah, go ahead. Rotting these malicious attackers, and that was just an excellent way to say it, like to cast out. Right. <laughs> I love these questions. So, They're great. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll throw out a couple, and then if I'll give you a chance, just if there are any that you want to grab too that I missed. But we had one from Tim. Um, is is Veeam backup for M three sixty five a cloud based solution, or do we need to install it on a server? So that's an excellent question. And the answer is both because we have it as a software that's provided and you can do this on your own on premises environment. You can directly deploy from the marketplace from like AWS, Azure, and even IBM cloud as an extension. But we also have an entire ecosystem of cloud service providers that will offer it back up as a service. It's the same software and you can find those from our portal side. I saw a couple questions around FedRAMP, HIPAA compliant, and a lot of these other compliance and regulations. You're able to search on there for our certain service providers that are able to help you meet those compliance and regulations if you want to throw off as to backup as a service. Okay, super. Um, this next one comes from uh, Theotis, who's asking, we currently utilize Veeam for other functions. However, our 365, specifically email, is backed up elsewhere. Can you describe a transition and whether Veeam has the ability to convert old backups without restoration? Can you repeat that one? Uh... Yeah, and it's, it's also, it's question number 67, if you're looking in there. Um, okay. Let me Thank you. let me grab that up here. So they're currently using Veeam uh, for for other things, uh, I assume other than three sixty five, um, and they're backing up their three sixty five yeah. email somewhere else. Um, and, so, and so he's he's wondering if you can describe a transition. So actually, if you add the external repository into backup and replication, you can still do restorations on that from the backup and replication server for the 365 data. But there are two different consoles at this time. We're currently working on some 
conversations about how products would be integrated, I'd recommend getting in hold of your sales representative and give us some of that feedback. We want to know how you want to use it and how you would like it to be integrated. And like I said, the same thing with Edward and I, we get this feedback and we take it directly to our development. Your sales team does the same thing. They place feature requests. I'm on the feature request team and we'll be able to tailor it to what you guys want, not what we think you want at that time. Okay, great. Hey, uh, another question here. Uh, does Veeam back up the actual configuration of our tenant or just the data? Just the data. Okay. Um, you know, Corinne or, or Edward, were there any questions in there that jumped out at you that, uh, you know, that you wanted to grab here in the, in the live audio portion? There was a, there was a, a question around price and I think that's worth addressing. Uh, so this is, this is a, a subscription based product, um, kind of falls in line with, with how M365 is, is licensed, uh, $1.70 per user per month, pretty reasonable. Um, and we do offer some discounts, some pretty deep discounts, um, up to actually, we have a special promo right now. Uh, so it's even up to as high as 15% off. And of course, if you work directly with a salesperson, um, I'm sure we can even find some, some other additional discounts as well. So, um, yeah, that's, that's how pricing works. I'm okay, reading super. through and there's a lot of questions here. If it's possible, we can also get some emails back out to the end users. Some of these seem like they are looking for follow-up steps, like they have been interested and this might have been the tipping point to have a better conversation with maybe one of our representatives. Yep, we'll we'll get uh, all of these questions to you guys so that you can, uh, you can follow up as well. Um, right. I, I guess sort of the last question, uh, we had one from Ned who's wondering what's the next step after the 30 day trial period has, has expired, which, which seems like maybe a good place to leave it. Um, so Ned, you were one of the people I was talking about, uh, but we'll go ahead and address that one specifically. If you've done the 30 day trial, you should already have an accountant signed in. If you weren't already getting emails, uh, I would actually use, if you're looking at this page right now on the screen, the contact sales button at the top of the website is a great place to start. Just put a detailed description you want, like a demo, or you want a, someone in this region for this compliance to contact you about the 365 services, and we'll get whoever is local to you to help you figure out what next steps would be, what the cost would be for that, and uh, get you started. All right, super. Well, uh, Corinne and, and Edward, thanks for putting together a great presentation and uh, and for all the insights here in the Q and A. Really appreciate your time and uh, you know the all the uh, information about what what Veeam is up to. Thank you. For Thank you, Scott. Us. Okay, and finally, it is uh, it's time for our uh, gift card prize drawing. This and the winner of the three hundred dollar Amazon gift card today is Dennis Barakos from California. So, congratulations to Dennis. We will be in touch to get you your card. And with that, on behalf of the actual tech media team, I just want to thank Veeam again for making this event possible. And thanks as always for attending and for all of your great questions today. Like we said, we will we will pass those along if we didn't get your question in the live session. So that concludes today's event. Have a great rest of your day. Mm -hmm.